So I will start the meeting. My name is Chuck Berry. I will be the moderator for this session. I'm an adjunct professor here at Point Park. You may wonder, well, why am I here in this position? It's because of my sports background. For 30 plus years, I was a sports agent slash attorney who represented professional baseball players. And because of that background and my connections with the dean of the business school, I was asked to come over here and teach a few courses. One of the courses that I teach actually is eSports, which is a little bit crazy for an older guy like me to be teaching a sport that is so relevant to younger people. Uh, I also teach a, a class on representing professional athletes. Um, so I'm delighted to be here moderating, and I'm delighted to have Dr. Jo Dr. Karen Paul, and who is also an adjunct professor here, teaches a class here uh, locally on amateur sports. And Jordan Rooney um, is one of the emerging experts in the NIL field. And NIL, as I was checking with the students, I found out that they really don't have an awareness of what NIL is. Um, so we'll get into that. We'll get into the, a little bit of the background. But first, I'd like to introduce the two speakers. And I'll start, ladies first, uh, Dr. Hall, if you would uh, talk a little bit about your background and your involvement with NIL. Sure. Well, hello, everyone. And I'm so thrilled to be a part of this seminar. So thank everybody for tuning in. So I'm Dr. Karen Hall. And my background is, my sports background is extremely extensive. Um, local uh, Pittsburgh person, um, played basketball in high school, uh, was very good and ended up being recruited all over the country, ended up at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, played four years out there, undergraduate degree in broadcasting. So the goal was to get into uh, sports broadcasting as a color analyst. And my route, uh, sort of direct, but a little indirect, I, I actually started coaching college women's basketball at Duquesne University as an assistant coach. And from there, my coaching career and broadcast career began to mix. Uh, I've coached in every region of the country except the Pacific Northwest as a college head women's basketball coach. Also included some men's assistant uh, basketball coaching. In the midst of all the collegiate coaching, I began my career as a broadcaster at one of my universities, North Carolina A&T State University, where um, Coach Hall had her own show, her own weekly show. And uh, it was uh, produced by students and faculty, and I was obviously host of my show. So there lied my broadcast career and also um, championship operations uh, intermingled my career as far as championships. So for example, the NCAA Men's Basketball Championships were just here in Pittsburgh last weekend, along with the NCAA Division III Women's Basketball. So I worked championship operations. And in the midst of all that, I've had the opportunity to earn a master's degree at Geneva College and my doctorate degree in education and leadership and administration at Point Park University, which has led to an opportunity to teach as an adjunct in the Sports Arts Entertainment and Management Program which I totally love teaching amateur athletics. Uh, it's a great class. It's really a baseline uh, to really catch students up to speed in terms who are interested in sports or who just want to know about the collegiate happening, the model of amateur athletics. And this semester, I also add a, sport, a class in sports leadership. So that's my background. I can get into it more, but that's the 30 second, 45 minutes, 45 second um, background. And it's interesting that you started off with broadcasting to get you into sports. I also, when I was in college out on the West Coast, started working with ABC Sports. And as it turned out, that led to me being hired as a sports agent and uh, really got my sports career started as well. And of course, you teach at amateur athletics. Boy, what a change NIL has done for amateur athletics as well. And we'll get into that. Jordan. I know you're there. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, so I've uh, done a decent amount in sports. I have a creative agency here in Pittsburgh. Uh, we have a studio, content creation studio. 
uh, here on East Carson Street. Um, I initially got started, honestly, just by learning through the internet. Uh, about eight, nine years ago, I was just using Instagram, growing, selling Instagram pages just as a young person, uh, just trying to understand how to use social media. And when I learned that there were people out there who were actually getting paid to run social media accounts, that's when I decided, hey, that's what I want to do in some format. Um, and this was back when the interns did run the social media accounts. Now it's, it's a career and there's teams behind running brands for companies. Um, after deciding what I want to do, I figured I needed to figure out how to do it. So I started creating content myself, started building a brand, started building connections, which led me into doing workshops all over the country. Um, now internationally about building a brand. I think building a brand helps, uh, helps the under-resourced find resources. It helps people who don't have connections find connections, uh, allows people who've never started a business before, gives them an opportunity to start a business. Um, I've always been a, you know, an athlete. I played football overseas for a few years. Uh, so for me, I've always been interested in how building a brand can help people, help prevent people from getting jobs they don't want to have. When you look at the traditional model, of getting a career it's you know there's only a few different options based on your major and I've, I've viewed it as you know you can go out and do anything you want you can build an online portfolio for yourself and um you know live a life of, of passion and purpose and be able to make money while doing it um so i built a creative agency that hired people who a lot didn't have degrees and nearly none of them had marketing degrees uh, we hired people based on talent hired people who we're creative and um, we've worked on some pretty cool projects around the city. So we oversee right now the Pittsburgh region brand. So the region, uh, the brand for the entire region, the Andy Warhol Museum. Uh, so the Warhol's brand, those are just two of my creative agency works on. Um, for the past seven years, I've had a all-star football game, the NFBD all-star football game here in Pittsburgh, um, which has, has grown its presence. And with that, we've been doing personal branding workshops for, for athletes. And a lot of those players have now went to the NFL and you know, play on Division One teams. So I've always been involved and interested in helping athletes build their brands. When name, image, likeness rules started to get passed uh, about a year ago, I started looking at how I could have an impact there. Um, I was very big on educating people on social media, teaching people how to use social media with, uh, with substance, uh, use, seeing the deeper meaning and, and being able to connect communities. So I started pitching around the concept of being a personal brand coach to a few different universities. And uh, Duquesne University was interested in naming me the first personal brand coach in the NCAA. Uh, from there, it's, it's brought on a lot of uh, cool opportunities of um, now my, my newest agency, Jaster, which, which helps athletes build their brands. So we've worked with um, some pretty big brand deals. We did the first high school NIL campaign in the nation. Um, we've done probably... 40 to 50 deals helping college and high school athletes get paid. And, and now we represent our own athletes. Um, you know, a few, few local guys, Damar Hamlin, who plays for the Buffalo Bills. Um, we work with some guys who go to USC, Ole Miss, Georgia. Um, and for us, we, we view it as, as being able to disrupt the sports marketing industry by uh, appealing and serving Gen Z athletes. And I found out very early on when I was taking a, taking a major course on NIL, who was really the person that was speaking as a national expert? Jordan. Uh, Jordan has gotten to be known as a national, probably international expert in this area. And the thing that I want to stress, particularly to the high school students, but also to the college students here, that developing brand, we're going to talk about NIL, but developing brand is so important for each of you as well. Because brand is basically all about who you are and how, in a sense, I mean, it's important for you to know who you are, think about who you are, but as you move forward, opportunities, marketing, uh, that's going to be based to a large degree on your brand. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? So we love hearing a little more about that too. Uh, Jordan, while I've got you on here, why don't you talk about NIL. What does NIL stand for and how did we get to this point? So NIL isn't something that's you know necessarily new. Um, it's just NIL rules for, for college in high school are new. So you know as a regular person, as a professional athlete, you could use your name, 
you know, being able to put your name on something, your image, so a picture, video of you or your likeness, something that's associated back to who you are, um, could be involved in revenue generating opportunities. So, you know, pro athletes for forever have been in commercials and billboards and newspaper ads or whatever. Um, influencers have done this as well. But because of college athletes standing as, as student athletes and their eligibility, there were rules in place that they couldn't use their name, their image or likeness to be attached to anything that would generate revenue. Um, and this has went on forever. So this past year, the NCAA passed rules allowing college players to now be able to generate revenue for themselves, which um, is, is a huge deal because these are college athletes who've been making a lot of money for universities and coaches and recruiting sites and media. And, um, you know, they've been getting a scholarship, but the argument has been made is, you know, they, they didn't have the same entrepreneurial opportunities as students who didn't play a college sport. Uh, and that's the important thing to know about NIL. These, you're not paying college athletes to pay, to play. What you're doing is you're saying you're, they can't be restricted to now go start their business or brand. And that's the big shift that you see here is NIL before social media would look very different. But now that social media is a thing, if you have a strong brand, that's the same as, as having your own business. And so that's what NIL does is it allows athletes to now be entrepreneurial and, and sell ads or be a spokesperson or do a speaking appearance. Uh, before this past year, that wasn't allowed. Aaron, anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, absolutely. Um, very good point, Jordan. And it needs to be understood that when you talk about amateurism, the NCAA, National Collegiate of College Athletics, um, they don't really have a definition for amateurism. So that's really important. And what most people understand an amateur to be is someone who does not get paid um, by any entity as a um, amateur, which means college student athletes really are amateur. So the NCAA for decades has stood behind the fact that whether well, student athletes, the concern is the graduation, uh, university presidents, uh, athletic directors, you know, the graduation rate. And as I teach this class, and as a former student athlete myself, um, it's quite interesting that as student athletes, they are truly the product of every sport that is watched nationally or just locally. You just go out and watch a university team play or even at the lower level, right? And you see that as amateurs, but for the business of sport, and it's really, I'm gonna really hone in on that for those of you that are attending because sports at the collegiate level is a business, right? And that's why we're on here today. But the NCAA has truly hid behind the amateurism status to not allow student athletes to be compensated for their uh, sport. And the NIL has been, it's been a long journey to get to the NIL and being able to, for student athletes to be able to be paid for their name, image, and likeness. It's important also to remember that the colleges are not paying these athletes. And this is outside entities other than the actual university. Um, so that is where I really want to start and make sure that those that are tuning in understand that there's a history behind this whole notion of amateurism that now has led to NIL. We're still just touching the surface because as uh, I'll use the NCAA Division One men's basketball, it's a million billion dollar revenue generating event every year, March Madness as it has been branded. And the student athlete still does not get a dime, nickel, or penny from that business of that event. So I'll, I'll stop there so we can continue to go back and forth. When you talk about amateur, you can go all the way back to the Olympics. Any of you who just watched the Olympics recently, it used to be, to be in the Olympics, you had to be an amateur. And then that got pushed around and eventually I think the realization hit that the best athletes in the world are probably professional. So the Olympics made a shift where they allowed professionals in the Olympics, which they do now. And back in college sports, as Dr. Hall just said, all the money 
that's made in college sports traditionally has gone to the schools, to the conferences, nothing to the players. That first change several years ago in a lawsuit that was filed, you probably, you may be familiar with EA Sports. EA Sports does Madden football. EA Sports also has a major basketball game as well. And it turned out that that basketball game used likenesses of real life players in their game. Did the players get compensated for that? No, the schools got compensated for that. And a lawsuit was filed and it kind of changed the course of college athletics in that there were some restrictions placed on it, but basically it said that, hey, it's the athletes are the ones who should be able to benefit from this along with the colleges. Recently, last year actually, in 2021, there was a case, a Supreme Court case, the Alston case, that basically ruled that the NCAA could not put these restrictions on, that basically, and one of the uh, justices said this, that um, you're not a monopoly. You can't be a monopoly. And uh, therefore, if this case comes before us again and tries to expand on the rights of the students, the students are probably going to win. And based on that case, the NCAA discussed it. And this is one of the things that makes me very frustrated. The NCAA talked about it, talked about it, talked about it. They did nothing. Our House and Senate nationally talked about it, talked about it, talked about it, and did nothing. It ended up going down to the states, and the states were the ones who had to make decisions on this, and the states passed laws, Pennsylvania passed a law, and that's why it, that was July 1st, 2021. We're only nine months into this, so that's why we are where we are now. Um, Karen, can you talk a little bit about the Pennsylvania law that, uh, that came out of all of this? Yeah, and before I do that, though, I want to mention back to that EA Sports because it's the Eddie O'Bannon case. Eddie O'Bannon was a UCLA uh, men's basketball. And the, the unfortunate part about that lawsuit is that Eddie O'Bannon didn't even know that he was a part of a, a video game. And he only found out through a friend of his whose son was actually playing the game. So that's how far back things like this can go, where the student athlete is not even aware uh, what is happening. So in reference to the Pennsylvania law in regards to amateurism and uh, NIL, again, it goes back to where uh, student athletes, they one, they don't need an agent for NIL here. Uh, two, universities actually have, are creating university athletic positions uh, for those within a department of athletics for student athletes to have someone to talk to in reference to creating an NIL opportunity for themselves. So it is generating not only uh, monies for the student athlete, but also creating jobs within athletic department. The, there's so many new jobs that are created right now because of NIL and the, the big business of uh, student athletes being able to generate money, Chuck. But there are still, the Pennsylvania law, for instance, places restrictions yes. on the athletes and gives the schools some rights. Yeah. Can you speak at all to that? Or? Yeah, it, yeah and, and that's for compliance purposes because compliance are all these, uh, like the NCAA rules that restricts student athletes A through Z plus all in between. So that there's somewhat parameters around the parameter boundaries, I'll call it, so that the compliance officer won for eligibility purposes of the student athlete. Uh, because if they over, if they go over more than what is allotted, then the, and the eligibility of their playing time and their playing season becomes at risk, which means they can be deemed ineligible uh, for their season or for a certain period of time, Chuck. And Jordan? Uh, do you want to speak a little bit? I know since you're working with Duquesne, you've got to have some familiarity with that Pennsylvania law as well. Anything in there mm -hmm. strikes you is about the law? Yeah, I mean, I think I think in general, I mean, it's 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 been kind of like the, the Wild West. I mean, you know, to add a little, even a little bit more context, I think, you know, been working obviously with Duquesne, but have been working with athletes in other states and schools in other states. And, um, 
everyone's very unsure of when the NCA is going to crack down on certain things. <laughs> so like, the, you know, there is the law and there's, there's obviously um, it's, it's changing in every state because some states are repealing their laws because they realize that, you know, in, in the beginning, they wanted to have a law when NIL was getting discussed and they were like, oh, we want to make sure that we have an advantage. But now some are realizing that having a law at all actually could be restricting because the NCA has kind of punted it and the states who don't have laws um, can, it could be things can be a little bit more loose. So I think it's been interesting just not only in Pennsylvania, but how every state things have been a little bit different. And now you see states are allowing schools to go out and help athletes to secure NIL deals. And that's something that is going to drastically change the landscape of NIL because Ohio state is already at the forefront of this. They're going to actually be helping athletes to secure NIL deals. And of course, what's the biggest football program, college football program uh, in the country? People would argue it's Alabama. What was the first state to repeal its law? Alabama. Um, largely to benefit, I think, probably the University of Alabama. And it's interesting to note, there are 200 colleges, junior colleges, NAIA colleges, Point Park is uh, covered by this, that are covered by the Pennsylvania law. And there are, and some of the restrictions include players can't be involved with alcoholic beverages, can't be involved with casinos. And there's a few other restrictions. Players have to get permission from the schools to use school trademarks. Point Park is one of the schools that does allow trademarks. Does Duquesne allow the athletes to use trademarks, the, the Duquesne University trademarks? So it hasn't even really come up, um, you know, talk to Rick Christensen and compliance. Um, so there hasn't been an issue really where it's been like pressed with, with whether they would allow it or not. So up to this point, it's, you know, unsure. Now, did you also see the recent Adidas development? Did yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see now what Nike's response will be now that Adidas is going to have a program and essentially make athletes at their their partner schools, affiliates. Um, you know, we've we've seen the the shoe wars before, and it's it's something that's funny is that maybe it's not funny is that you know they were arresting people from Adidas two years ago for giving college athletes money, and now now they're allowed to actually legally do it. I think that might be one of the benefits when you talk about uh, the NIL because. I don't think it'll stop the under the table, the booster kind of thing, but it surely could neutralize because now it's on it's on top of the board where uh, student athletes can make money off of their name, image, and likeness, and not so much, um, you know, all which we've seen as 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 intense as the FBI case uh, two years ago with the whole Arizona and so forth and so on. And so the NIL to me, and as I continue to learn, is can become a neutralizer to limit some of the um, NCAA violations that may occur because student athletes, quote, need money. And um, it's interesting too that initially the NIL deal started with individual athletes. The Adidas deal that was just announced a couple of days ago, Adidas is making available benefits to all college Division I athletes, whether it's football, gymnastics, crew, whatever it might be, um, if their school is an Adidas school. And I guess there's 109 schools, about 50,000 athletes that are eligible, and they can make money based on social media, are they able to, they have social media uh, sites that can uh, boost Adidas and, and mention Adidas and try and direct people to Adidas. Uh, there's a couple of other ways in which they can be compensated, but it's, it really changes the landscape too, because now instead of individual athletes, you're talking about a whole broad class of athletes. The other thing I found interesting was initially one of the most successful NIL athletes was not a football player, was not a basketball player, but was a female gymnast, and I forget what school she went to, um, but had tremendous social media coverage. She had hundreds of thousands of people who followed her. And when you look at companies and how they evaluate value, if they see somebody who has 100,000 followers, they like that because then if they can advertise for them, 
they're advertising to another 100,000 people out there. Um, Jordan, have you run into a lot of these changes going from, you know, individuals to more to larger groups? And of course, the Adidas thing is probably the largest group we've seen. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think what you're seeing is a lot of brands are still trying to understand NIL. Um, like who you mentioned, Livy Dunn, uh, who's at LSU. I mean, she's an influencer, you know, you know, her, she's an athlete, but her, her value in terms of NIL is, is just like an influencer marketing deal. Like you'd see from any other celebrity where a lot of brands are trying to figure out their fit is with a lot of high profile athletes who don't treat social media. Like they are an influencer. They just post videos of their highlights and pictures of them on the field and things like that. And they're not seeing a great return. So it's, it's been interesting to see how brands have gotten creative. You've seen things like Jack in the Box has sponsored athletes who are named Jack. You've seen Arby's has said, you know, any athlete, any running back who says, I'm going to Arby's tonight on their Instagram story, I'm gonna, we're going to pay them $500. You've seen um, Denny's have done like the pancake team. So for O-linemen who have pancake blocks, they would sponsor them. So it, there's a few different categories where you see this, where – you're now uh, the brand or a group who's doing like group licensing deals, allowing players to sell their own gear. Illinois actually just uh, launched a storefront for players to be able to, so where players can sell their gear, um, their licensed gear. And it has a, a ticker that shows how much money players have made um, from royalties from that. You have uh, like Libby Dunn example, where athletes who just have a big following or be treating as, being treated as influencers where I would say the fan is as much concerned as how they are on the field, on the court, on the mat. And then you have like Bryce Young from Alabama and a few of these other big names who really don't use social media, but because they are a huge name, they can be on the TV commercial or they can be on the billboard. So it's interesting to see the, you know, the intersection of how digital media has opened up for more opportunities or like in the Bryce Young example, to where like, you know, Johnny Manziel and those types of guys, if these big football stars, if they would have just been allowed to make money, they would have made millions just by allowing someone to use their image. So keep that, keep that word in mind, influencers, because when it talks about social media and influencers, the number of people, the number of followers you have, you become an influencer. Uh, Karen? Yeah, I, um, I also want to add, too, with the NIL. And I, I look at it from the standpoint of uh, not only amateurism, but neutralizing. Because you have men's athletics and women that, women's athletics. That's just how it goes. So the NIL allows all student athletes, right, in, in those non-traditional sports where we talked about, you know, the gymnasts. But also in our day right now of celebrating 50 years of Title IX, this NIL is so timely, because it, is, it gives women student, female student athletes an opportunity just as well as our male counterparts to make money off of their, their brand, their, their uh, influence on social media. And it doesn't have to be that they are the best student athlete in their sport. So it's a neutralizer again, and I see it as a benefit. I talk about challenges and benefits of amateurism same way with the NIL, which I see this totally as a neutralizer. So where there's no one that literally is left out. And again, I mentioned where the institutions are bringing people on board to assist in NIL opportunity. It's so important to keep in mind um, as we move forward in this whole NIL conversation. Good point. Um, and also I just wanted, social media is so important uh, these days. People use it. People talk about the pluses, people talk about the minuses. Talk about social media for just a second with athletes and just your general perception of social media, the things that people need to be aware of. Yeah, I always say be careful what you put out on social media, period. Because one, once it's out there, it's out there and, and you cannot pull it back. And for student athletes, I mean, that can go so many different directions because the media loves when, when student athletes, especially our high profile, uh, present anything out there that could be newsworthy and sports worthy and how they can take that post that is meant to be positive or inspiring or motivating and turn it into a quote story 
when really there is no story. So I really start there when I'm talking about amateurism and posting on social media. It's a good, good media outlet to get your word out there, to increase your value and your followers. Excellent opportunity for marketing and branding yourself. However, it can also be a detriment because as I always focus in on the media too, always looking for story and there's no such thing as off the record. There's no off the record. If, if it's out there, it's able to be pulled into and investigated and find out if there's anything more to what that post may say, which is not is saying nothing except what it says. And we've seen situations where people put something out there, take it off within 30 seconds, within a minute, but people have seen it, people have captured it, and uh, there, like you say, there's no pulling back. Jordan, you deal with brands, so brands obviously utilize social media to a large extent. What have you seen with respect to pluses and minuses? I, I'm kind of curious as far as the minuses in particular with social media. Yeah, so I, I say I, I come from the, the school of thought that, um, you know, social media is a tool. I think uh, there's a it's easy to, to call it toxic. It's easy to say, you know, it's all negative and there are negative and toxic elements to it, but there also are negative toxic elements to your physical relationships and conversations that you have. You know, social media can be used as a tool, just like anything else, just how we use books or, or music or, or really anything. So <clears throat> it's up to the person who's using it, how, how they want to utilize that tool. And what we always tell athletes or even like young people, cause we have, um, for Pittsburgh public high school students who work for us, they make $18 an hour. And right now they make TikToks for the Andy Warhol Museum. They're getting paid, it's their job. Social media is a way to amplify what you do to be seen by a larger group of people. And so, you know, I try not to be as restrictive with it. Um, what Dr. Hall just said is you know, perfectly, I agree with everything. And I think there's a different way, another layer to it where, you know, the authentic version of you, the, 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 per, the, part of you that wants to have connection, that wants to establish value, that wants other people to take something away from you and you want to be a role model. We all grow up in some way wanting to be a role model. Well, social media gives you that opportunity. So it, it doesn't, it's not a place just to show off. It's not a place just to, to, you know, to be negative. It's an opportunity to amplify your physical presence into a digital sense. So what a lot of brands are seeing is the people who just use social media to show off aren't the ones who have a deep connection with their audience. If, you, if I'm a brand and I want to sponsor someone, I'm sponsoring someone because they are able to potentially change the buying behavior of the people that follow them. You know, I have this bubbly here. If I want a person, a group of people to now buy bubbly, well, I'm not going to give it to an athlete who people just follow them just because they like the way they play on the field. They're not, people aren't going to drink something just because they like the way someone plays. What they are going to do is if they're going to, if they have an interest in who they are as people, if they have an interest in their interest, that's what's ultimately going to change their buying behavior. So this is where brands are seeing a much larger return in athletes who have figured out how to use social media in a way to drive connection, not just be what I say is a letterman's jacket. All of their posts are just them on the field, on the court, working out, et cetera. They talk about their interests. They talk about things they care about. They try and help people. They try and add value. Um, and that's what we do with the brands we work with. We don't just look at, you know, here's how good you are. And this is why I think you've seen that uh, women's basketball is the second best performing in terms of NIL is because women do a much better job of, of showcasing their authenticity online and, and building real connection where guys try and act emotionless and try and act too cool. And what I say is if you're too cool for social media, you're too cool to get a brand deal. And so that's where brands are really trying to evaluate. Like it doesn't matter as much on-field performance that helps, but let's take it a level deeper and see what type of connection they have with their audience. But that certainly speaks to what Karen was talking about earlier too, and equity, uh, particularly between men and women's sports these days. The NIL goes a large way toward doing that. For the students out there, I would say, Pay attention to that in particular, pluses, minuses. And also keep in mind, you're gonna have an opportunity to ask some questions a little later. Who knows, we may ask you questions too, so stay alert. Uh, Karen, getting back to you for just a second, um, amateur athletics, uh, as an agent for 30 plus years, 
and I dealt with professional athletes. You could not deal, or there were very strict limitations on what you could do with amateur athletes. Mm -hmm. One of the things that strikes me as being a real slippery slope is the fact that for NIL deals, athletes have to deal with either attorneys, financial advisors mm -hmm. to get advice, or agents. So all of a sudden, you've had this situation where for so long, agents could not talk to athletes about professional contracts. Now they technically still can't talk to them about the professional mm -hmm. contracts, but they are allowed to talk to them about NIL. Is that not a pretty slippery slope? Uh, it's definitely a slippery slope. It's so compliance, it's not even funny. But I tell you what, I'm such a proponent of the NIL because of the and I've said it before, because the student athlete is the product. And, you know, it is just amazing how far we've come to where now agents who were like slapped on a hand, forbidden, don't even go near the student athlete, can now have some relationship uh, with the student athlete. However, it's still slippery slope because technically, right, as far as the NCAA still sees it, they are still amateurs. And that is... We, we really have to get past that because honestly, student athletes are employees of a university. They're ambassador of a student athlete. They are not. And we get into the bait of a student slash a student athlete. Well, there's major differences. And what we're talking about now is this slippery slope of agents, right? NIL compliance issue that it all feeds the same bowl, right? It's all into the same bowl, but it has to be divided not equally, but safely for the benefit of the student athlete in terms of eligibility. Anything goes awry, it's not the agent, it's not the institution, it's the student athlete who gets penalized, still penalized for crossing over certain lines in regards to compliance. Because we haven't talked about it much, I'm bringing it up, but the compliance officer and this NIL a representative at these universities, they have a very difficult job because NIL is wide open for every student athlete. And you bring up another interesting topic too, uh, which we're not gonna get into today, but another interesting issue for student athletes is are they technically employees? Or actually mm -hmm. I should say, are they legally employees yeah. of the university, which creates a whole lot of issues with respect to things like workman's comp and how they're compensated and whether they can be compensated. We won't get that in, into that here, but that's another issue that will be coming down the pipe. There's already been a couple of lawsuits regarding that. Um, I have another person online here, uh, Alex Gaminski, who's a local attorney that represents uh, some players uh, and has been active in NIL. Alex, I don't know, I know you're muted right now. Can you unmute and uh, join us for a moment? No, maybe he can't. Let's see if I can do anything to assist that. Maybe not. Well, Alex, if, if you're able to join us, we'd love to get your uh, thoughts on NIL as well. Um, I did have Alex come to my class at the end of uh, last semester um, to talk about the whole idea of um, NIL and agents and how the two uh, go together without jeopardizing uh, the student athlete. So uh, if he is able to get on, that would be a great opportunity. There he is. There he is. Alex. Dr. Hall, Mr. Barry, sorry I stepped away for a moment. No problem. Welcome. Uh, I understand. I know you've talked to Bob Durda in the past and uh, have been into Dr. Hall's class in the past. And I understand you are, I know you by name, we have not met, um, but you're a local attorney who does represent some clients uh, dealing with NIL. Is that correct? Yes, I'm, I'm a NFL PA contract advisor as well as in the CFL uh, PA, and I'm a local attorney here in, in Pittsburgh. Well, tell us a little bit, if you've been listening at all, uh, some of your thoughts about the NIL experience with your clients. Any sure. Sure. The, uh, the NCAA uh, removed, you know, calling 
college athletes, amateurs, uh, and basically said that we're not going to be jeopardizing uh, NCAA eligibility for amateur athletes if they wanted to go out and get compensated for NIL deals. Um, that being said, they didn't actually put in any laws or policies in place to govern how that's going to be rolled out. So what they did was they left it up to each state uh, to determine uh, how they wanted the regulations to be rolled out, how they wanted to uh, compensate players, what was considered fair market value, uh, and what the restrictions were. Um, so in, in every state has its own laws to to govern when things go wrong, uh, the state is actually the one that brings, you know, a prosecution or an accusation. It's not uh, the NCAA or the school. Um, so each different state has these these laws set up in place, and they're seven or eight pages long. Uh, they basically copy and paste uh, the previous state. I think everybody copied California or, or Florida, um, but there are little tweaks from from a state to state basis that says. Uh, who is allowed to represent the players in NIL deals. Um, and I know that for Pennsylvania, uh, in order for a player to sign a contract uh, with an, an NIL agent, there the agent has to be either licensed as a athlete agent within the state uh, or they have to be an attorney. Uh, and then there's one other qualification. I believe it's a, a certified uh, financial advisor, but I'm not exactly sure of that. Um, so I have several uh, NIL clients that I do uh, deals for uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, all throughout the country, I have a player at Kansas. I have a player at Michigan State. Uh, I have a player at Ohio State. And um, it's been it, – it's like Jordan said. It's kind of like the Wild West. Every Everybody's kind of just doing what they think that they're allowed to do. And until somebody says that they can't do it, um, usually in the form of a compliance officer – um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very interesting kind of way to go trial by fire, uh, essentially is, is do it until they say you can't do it. Now, so, I, you know, to Dr. Hall, that it's kind of a slippery slope because you are, uh, contracted as well. Um, you're technically still not allowed to discuss any of that with your clients. You can only discuss NIL stuff. Do you find that to be a difficult situation to be in? No, they're they're exclusive of each other. You, you know, as a professional athlete or as a professional athlete agent, we'll eventually talk about the professional athlete contracts and career path and opportunities and, and projections and things like that. But uh, as far as the NIL goes, it, it gives me an opportunity to, ve to develop a real working relationship with, with my clients where we talk about income and, and profits versus losses and we talk about taxes and setting up multiple uh, bank accounts to separate personal income from marketing income. Um, you know, so I, I do teach them about being a, a businessman and, and having, uh, habituating with professional skills that uh, businesses and employers and business owners like uh, to work with, uh, with any brand ambassador that's going to be advocating or promoting their product or service or events. Um, you know, they want to make sure that they're working with people that are, are business savvy, that, that have proper um, acumen and, and representation and, and kind of know the do's and don'ts um, and that, that want to work with uh, the businesses that, uh, as Jordan was saying, you know, speak to their connection, that they want to be able to connect with their audience. So they try and find athletes that uh, represent that in their own personalities, not just the way that they are on the field. And I can see that benefit He's being able to deal with clients at an earlier age so that they're not becoming professionals, getting large amounts of money in their contracts and not really having much of an idea of what to do with it. So there is, certainly is that benefit. Well, so Alex, I appreciate you joining us here for a few minutes and getting your input as well. Um, there are other, where this is a course in developing trends in sports. One of the developing trends that we've seen in addition to NIL, which is huge, but are NFTs. Um, Jordan, I wonder, have you had any experience with NFTs? Uh, yeah, we, we launched one of the, the first athlete-driven NFT campaigns um, with DeMar Hamlin, who was at Pitt at the time, now at the Buffalo Bills. 
Um, what NFTs are, which for me really took a while to wrap my arms around and understand. Yeah, NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Um, you can't, if you try and think too much into it, you won't understand it. Uh, it's essentially a, a digital version of art or uh, collectible or think uh, you have a physical trading card. Now you have a digital trading card. You know, it's under the belief that um, with our ever-changing uh, digital world, things are, things are all now all going digital, that digital assets now have, have value attributed to them. Um, so now you see whether it's a, you know, a digital painting or a drawing or, you know, now it's even, it could be a song. Um, NFTs allow for you to uh, verify the, the ownership of something through the blockchain. And also what it does is um, it allows for a, a royalty structure. So artists who um, maybe in the past have had to sell a painting once for a certain price and then from there, the art community uh, then continues to sell that painting for more and more money where the artist doesn't see any of that money. Um, with NFTs, the original creator of the NFT can have a royalty for the lifetime of however long that, that piece of digital art is sold. So there's so many different factors that go into NFTs. Um, it's been interesting to see how they've been utilized with NIL because NFT is such a a buzzworthy topic that, um, you know, there's so many different platforms launching to sell college athlete NFTs and college athlete, anything associated with NFT. And, and a lot of them have really haven't been successful because the, the, the market's become extremely saturated. Um, so, you know, there, there's, a, there's a couple of different ways you can look at NFTs. So I, I understand I, one of the questions I had was authentication. Um, you know, how do you authenticate the, this type of artwork? And you mentioned blockchain. Um, how does that do that? Yeah, so I mean, it's, you know, it's something that'd be easier to show than tell, but there's things like uh, Etherscan, which shows that a transaction has taken place. So uh, anyone who owns crypto, um, NFTs, things like that, things that are on the blockchain, you have your own wallet, a crypto wallet, and your crypto wallet is basically tracks your transactions. So if I owned an NFT, I would be able to verify that I own it because it is something that has taken place on the blockchain. Good example of this could be like, I don't know, if I, if I send you a picture and you right click and look at the properties, you could potentially see that the picture you gotten is a copy where I could see that mine was the original. And I think that's maybe like the easiest way to understand it, but you can verify based on your crypto wallet that it was you were the one that purchased this specific thing. So you see a lot of people make jokes about NFTs where you can just um, screenshot it and now own it, but their crypto wallet would not show that they actually have verified ownership of that NFT. So you've got NFTs and crypto kind of going together. And of course, cryptocurrency is a, a big thing these days. And I don't know, I, from what I understand, both NFTs and cryptocurrency have a great deal of volatility to them as far as prices going up and down. Have you seen that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, you know, anything that is, that is new and is just not getting, getting established, there's going to be, it, it's going to be volatile. So especially when you look at same thing with stocks, I mean, stocks go up and down as well. Um, in terms of crypto replacing our, you know, everyday currency, that's not something that, that is, is currently happening. So uh, you could look at crypto just in the same way that you would look as investing into a stock. And it's interesting, I asked my class about that, and uh, actually I've got one student in here who actually had invested a little bit in crypto and NFTs. Um, any, any high school students ever have any experience with NFTs or crypto? Probably a little bit young for that. Um, it's hard for someone of my age to wrap my arms completely around that. Esports, I teach an esports class, that's the other thing, and I see that NFTs and cryptos are becoming huge in esports as well, especially with the teams um, utilizing that as royalty awards, or kind of loyalty awards. Airlines give away miles. Uh, teams like the Pittsburgh Knights can give away NFTs and crypto based on uh, how much someone is involved with the Pittsburgh Knights, what they might buy from the Pittsburgh Knights. Um, it, it's interesting the interrelationship there. 
Karen, have you gotten into any of this, the NFTs, the crypto? Uh, we have yet to get that far in amateur amateur athletic class. But Chuck, I would love to ask you a question. You know, with esports just blowing up all over, talk about the evolution and even how esports came about. Because one day we just hit all sports, and the next thing you know, we have esports. So, I mean, I think that's something that would be of interest um, for those interested in sports to know that they have so many options in reference to the career of sport. Let me ask the high school students again. How many of you consider yourself to be gamers? How many of you play games, whether it's you know, anything from Mario? So I see quite a few, a lot of hands. Esports is competitive gaming. So it basically originates with gaming, with all the different games, whether it's Madden, whether it's uh, A, whether it's uh, League of Legends, whether it's Rocket League, whether it's Smash. Um, the competitive aspect is esports. Point Park has an esports team. If any of you are really into Valorant, League of Legends, or Rocket League, Point Park actually offers scholarships on their esports team, which is part of the athletics department. Um, so it's interesting how this has evolved. It's, it goes back 20 plus years ago and um, started in the Far East, was big in Europe, including Ukraine was a major player. And it's only been in the last, well, it actually goes back about 30 years. It's only been in the last 20 years or so that it's come to the United States and become bigger and bigger in the United States. So that is another one of those. And we had a, we had a discussion on this in the trend seminar a couple of years ago as well, and we'll probably do it again down the road. Uh, Robert Morris also has an esports team. University of Pittsburgh is talking about putting a whole lot of money into building an esports facility out there and eventually having an esports team as well. Uh, teams or places like Ohio State, Oklahoma, Michigan State, major universities are sinking. Matter of fact, there was just an article about, I think it was Michigan State. Was it North Carolina State? One of the big universities got $16 million from the state government to build an esports facility. Ours was a lot less than that, I can guarantee you that. Uh, but we do have an esports facility here at Boyd Park as well. Um, so, e yeah, esports, the evolution of esports is fascinating. Uh, and the money involved in esports is fascinating. And as I said, the intersection between esports, NFTs, and cryptocurrency is fascinating. Jordan, uh, have you had any esports experiences? Uh, no, not 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 as much. Just more so um, with uh, more, I guess, traditional athletes. You're such a cutting edge, trending guy. I'm going to have to have lunch with you and uh, get you going in that too. Uh, it would probably make some sense because it is really a cutting edge area right now and 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 why is it such a big area there's estimates that in the demographic kids and i say kids young adults between the age of 15 and 35 that the estimate is that as many as 75 percent of those people are involved in gaming not necessarily esports but at least gaming and that because of that they tend to follow esports Twitch is a streaming service that uh, is huge with esports, um, and you get a lot of followers through Twitch. But that's because of those demographics, because of that following, established following, you're getting sponsors, you're getting your Nikes, you're getting your Coca-Colas, you're getting your car dealers, are all interested in advertising on esports. Um, it's not built up to the level of a Super Bowl yet, but more and more you're getting more companies putting more and more money into sponsorships of esports because they know if they're interested in that young demographic, this is one way to hit it. Um, so I guess that'll probably be another trends, uh, sports trends in years to come as well as we talk a little more about that. But it is fascinating. And I just literally found out about this there are esports four or five years ago and uh, have become 
not an expert, but at least uh, done a deep dive into this over the years and, and teaching the course as well. It is fascinating. But getting back to NIL, um, I want to see if there are, and I don't know, Olivia, if you've been able to see if there's any questions online. And with the students, I'd like to see, do you have any questions right now? And I'll expect to at least see one or two questions. Remember, I told you at the beginning, think about potential questions. And there's a lot of interesting stuff here, NIL, even NFTs, eSports, but particularly NILs. Are there any athletes here among the group? Okay, we've got a couple of athletes too. The other thing about NIL that is interesting and uh, Jordan, you talked about it for just a minute there. It is expanding to high school level as well. I know California had passed a law allowing NIL at the high school level. Can you tell us a little more about high school NIL? Yeah, I mean, now you have California, Illinois, New York, New Jersey, a few others who, who are now coming onto the, the scene with high school NIL. Um, so like I said earlier, we were part of the first high school NIL deal in the nation. Um, when you look at um, the differences between high school NIL and college NIL, um, you know, you have the National Federation for High School Sports and you have things like PIA, which oversees the, you know, the state, um, but they don't quite have the same resources to monitor things as the NCAA would or, you know, school, you know, high school athletic director um, has a lot of things going on to now add onto their plate, their athletes receiving NIL deals. Um, so it, it gets a little bit more complicated, but I am a, a big believer, a big component of, um, that high school athletes should be able to, to monetize their NIL if done in the right way. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me that, um, like a good example is Rodney Gallagher who plays for Lowell Highlands and has 85,000 Instagram followers to where one of his peers at Lowell Highlands who doesn't play a sport could launch an app or start a business and be able to use their name or their image behind it. But Rodney, who's now built a brand for himself, can't use any of those 85,000 followers to support him or his family. Um, so, you know, I understand the concerns of, of where, what could happen potentially with recruiting or, you know, if, if money is mismanaged, but you know, that's, we live in a capitalistic society and entrepreneurial and digital ventures are, um, a very important part of, of our economy and young people can, like being young is an advantage now in the digital economy. So I am a little frustrated that, you know, uh, organizations like the PIA and, you know, even when you look at Ohio, West Virginia, like there hasn't been more of a push. I'm hoping after this school year that it, we see what had happened with the NCAA last year to where every state is like, okay, this is inevitable. Let's empower high school athletes to be able to monetize their NIL, but let's put the right resources around them, whether it's financial literacy, education, you know, understanding how to do things in the right way. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's I think it is coming. It's just a matter of what will cause the states and the National Federation for High School Sports to feel this push. And it's only been nine months. We're only nine months into NIL, really, at the college level. Um, it is encouraging to see that there are a few states that are doing it. Uh, Karen, have you had any experience at the high school level, amateur athletics there with NIL? Uh, not recently. However, it goes again back to the whole argument of, of, of amateurism. I mean, Jordan just mentioned it. You have a high school student who has their Instagram, their followers, and they can monetize. Whereas a student athlete has just as many, but because there's no, I won't say not the knowledge behind it, but the understanding of how to create parameters on a high school level, you know, there's no benefit. But as a student athlete at, that, at any of these schools, they bring recognition to the school, the notoriety, opportunity for branding to the school in their position as a student athlete. But yet again, because of rules and, and history and the fact of amateurism, they're unable to monetize. There's still the argument and it, it, it's knowledge based because there is opportunity for high schools, as Jordan mentioned, the state, the cities and states, to allow student athletes in the high school level to benefit from their name, image, and likeness. A lot of, lot of um, room to grow here. More knowledge is needed, but while this is happening, the student athlete 
is still unable to capitalize on who they are as a student athlete at the high school level. We talk about this in uh, esports, and it really is the wild, wild west. There are not the same kind of laws, rules, regulations, mm -hmm. football, basketball, baseball, collective bargaining agreements that set the relationship between teams and players. There's none of that right now in esports. And certainly NIL is in a similar situation. You would expect that the NCAA might put some rules in place down the road. The states, there's such variance between the states. And as we discussed, Alabama has already gotten rid of its, all of its rules and regulations. And you'll probably see other states doing that because to be competitive and to attract athletes, you want to have them be able to maximize their NIL opportunities. And if there's no rules and regulations, then that's going to give them probably a greater opportunity. But it really does create a wild, wild west type of atmosphere. So once again, high school students first. Any questions that you might have? I know there's a couple athletes out there. One question at least. OK. How do you become a professional athlete? Yeah. And of course, you've got a whole lot of different sports. Are you talking about maybe one particular area? Um, I think Right. And so the question is, how do you become a professional athlete? And in particular, roller derby. Um, so much of this depends on how much money is involved in any particular sport. And roller derby, I'm assuming there probably, there probably is a ruling governor or government, uh, not government entity, but a ruling entity that kind of controls uh, and gives you some guidance. I mean, that's what I would try and do is Google and see if there are any entities out there that at least say that they control some of these different leagues, because I understand there are different leagues. And um, so there are professional players out there. That would be probably the best idea. Karen and uh, Jordan, any idea on uh, how to find out more about becoming a professional roller derby person? I mean, roller derby definitely um, has made a comeback because for a while it was huge. But again, you made a good point. It's always about finances. And then even at a collegiate level that you are involved in a roller derby club, Somehow you have to be involved in the actual sport to even ascend to a next level. And then you talk about talent level, um, agencies, and the sport professional teams. So there's more in it than um, or how to become that professional roller derby or any professional athlete. Um, but definitely uh, research. And if you know of just one person that's involved in the actual sport of roller derby, that's a great network to stay connected to, to then move you further in line to um, trying to answer and attain the uh, height you want to go to if it is as a professional uh, roller derby athlete. That's a similar problem that we run into with esports too. There's no overarching uh, entity that's in charge of everything. So you have to go a whole lot of different places if you want to become a professional in esports as well. Um, that's a situation you run into. It is kind of the wild, wild west problem. We still have a roller derby. Any other questions over here? All right, I got one back there. You'll have to speak up. Do I think there'd be what? All right, good question. Follows up. So the question is, with student athletes at the university level, do you think you'll see a time when they get paid by the university? And of course, this partly deals with this employee, whether they're employees or not as well, comes into play that hasn't been decided yet. Um, but there are cases. Karen, you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, four letters, NCAA. <laughs> And, and the model, there has to be a new model uh, by the NCAA because they're truly operating on a prehistoric model that does not even exist for that to happen right now, to answer your question. Because I mentioned it early that right now, as the NIL is great, 
it's still we still need to get to where uh if not the institution but at least these mega money generating events such as march madness uh not only give money to the institution because that money is shared but some of that money comes to the student athletes so the model of the NCAA in reference to paying student athletes. Uh, I'm not sure how close we are with that. Um, like you said, Chuck, we won't go that far, but I know Northeastern University up in uh, Chicago, you know, they threw out that lawsuit a couple of years ago. Um, so, you know, that I'm gonna just stay right there, but it's the model of the NCAA and their thinking that it's not, it's not bad to pay student athletes, they are the product. And there are some added benefits that universities pay to players related to education and, and some additional resources, but it's limited, very limited. Uh, Jordan, do you have any thoughts on that particular issue? Yeah, I think it's on it's on uh, high profile college athletes if that's what they want to do is to to force the NCAA to make a change, similar to, to you know NIL. I think social media pressure really helped that. Um, you know, I've actually been talking with a few high level quarterbacks in the NCAA um, to start bringing attention to this. I think like when you look at bowl games and such and, um, you know, fans want to get mad because athletes want to sit out of bowl games, we'll give them a profit share, get to incentivize them, give them more of a reason to risk injury. Uh, I think if, if college athletes, high level college athletes said before this season, we're not going out on the field until we get a percentage of our school's profits. What, what, what would the NCAA do? Like, this is where athletes need to realize they have the power. And if they could just come together, I don't know if that's in the form of a union. I don't know if that's in the form of just an initiative. Um, they can do anything they want. And I'm not saying it's easy, but I am saying if this is something that they do want to happen, like, the athletes do have all of the control. I'm not saying what's good or what isn't good, mm -hmm. but if they want something to happen, all they need to do is, is come together on it. If, if every, if 10 major college quarterbacks got in a group message and said, Hey, we're saying we're sitting out unless they, they give us 10% of the profits they make off of us this year, what's going to happen. The conference can be like, well, we got to figure this out. So it's just, it's just up to the athletes on how they want to take control of things like this. Yeah. Yeah, and also, I just read, Chuck, that I just read this morning, the, uh, I have it in front of me, the National College Players Association is actually filing a, a suit, a complaint against the U.S. Department of Education against Division I schools for this very question, like for this opportunity to be paid uh, by the schools. And that's as of today. I think it came out of Northwestern. One of the schools picked yeah, meant Northwestern, yes. Uh, had attempted to unionize, and I think uh, they were not able to, but that's an issue that's going to, you're going to see that continue to crop up, I'm sure, down the road. Any other questions out there? High school students? Yes. How Steve a scholarship? That's an, the question is, how do you receive a scholarship in eSports? And uh, I've talked to Chris Gall, who is the coach here, and that is a difficult issue to deal with right now because in college football, you see all the tryouts that are going on. You see the um, different means in which college athletes can show the pros what's going on. High school athletes have means by which they can get information out and college coaches are out there uh, checking things out because it's a wild, wild west. There's not a centralized way that you can do that. I think, if you find out what schools are interested, yeah, I mean, there's two ways to do it. If you find out what schools have programs and what, if you have a particular game that you're interested in, put together a little demo tape or at least a little resume that shows what you've done, what level you're playing at. Um, sometimes the games themselves have uh, ways of ranking uh, and that you can utilize that too as a sales pitch, but it's not, it's still the wild, wild west with respect to scholarships and, and things like that. And COVID, of course, made it that much more difficult. So you may see some things coming out. Chris Gall is the coach here. Uh, you can always get in touch with him uh, if you do have interest. Hey, 
Uh, yeah, I know, I know, 11 o'clock. Um, so we are winding down. Other questions? Any other questions? Karen and Jordan, any closing thoughts here as we're talking about NIL and about trends that we've touched on briefly, non-fungible tokens, crypto, esports, and the like, but particularly focusing on NIL. Karen, any closing thoughts? Of course, always thoughts. Uh, yeah, so for all of the students out there, you know, it's a business. The sport is a business, and NIL is has made it even more of an interesting uh, part of the business of sport, where you know student athletes can monetize their name, image, and likeness. So you know, if you have an interest in athletics and collegiate athletics in particular, you know, just stay abreast to the trends and the happenings of what is going on. It changes every day. There is something new every day happening whether it's in men's, women's athletics, NIL, crypto, branding, all the different uh, areas of athletics. But mainly, understand it is a business. You know, people, we see the games and the hoopla and the pageantry, but behind it is truly a business, and every single second, something's changing. Good thoughts. Jordan? Yeah, I think, you know, one, one key takeaway if you're going to take anything away from this is that like the internet gives you access the internet gives you opportunity and whether it's uh, as an athlete or someone who wants to work in athletics or work with an athlete you know i i got started just going out and asking people to do their brand for free build up a portfolio and now i get paid to do it um you know be purposeful in how you use this you know you can reach anyone you want at any time and if you are intentional and have the right strategy with how you do things you don't need to get a job that you hate you can figure out how to use your personality use your skill set and monetize it whether it's in sports or something else one thing i mentioned about jordan too jordan hires local people um i would google jordan and that's with an o j-o-r-d-o-n rudy rudy an easy name to remember um, and watch where he's going because he's definitely going places, whether it's uh, international, here, nationally, um, a lot of good things going on. And the thing that he emphasizes too that I think is so important, particularly for students, is brand. Try and figure out what your brand is. What is it that you like? What is it that you're good at? Everybody has strengths, everybody has weaknesses to figure out how to really work and benefit from your strengths. Um, and hopefully that'll get you to a place where you have, that you have a passion for. And that's the whole idea with jobs. I love being able to get in front of students like this. This is something that isn't work for me. It's actually pleasure. Um, that's what you want to be able to do in life. So it's great to have you here. Jordan, thank you very much. Karen, thank you. Alex, thank you for jumping on for a few minutes as well. Any last questions? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to ask if they had suggestions if the students were interested in possibly helping getting more involved in this and then can I ask how do they do it? What platforms do you use? And then Jordan, would you be willing to share examples of maybe athletes that you work with that we can look at their platforms and see the examples? So if they, did you catch that, Jordan? Yeah, yeah, I heard it. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of us, I mean, you could look at, um, you know, our, our, our agency's uh, page, you can see our athletes. So it's Jaster, J-A-S-T-E-R, creative. Uh, Jaster Creative is our Instagram. Uh, in terms of getting started, yeah, I actually did a, a TikTok video on this. Um, find a Division One athlete who goes to a school nearby yours and ask them if you could help with their brand and give yourself an official title and say, hey, call me your brand manager. You now have something on your portfolio that you now work in sports. Me, someone who hires people who works in sports, I'm much more likely to hire someone who has a, a line on their resume with, with real experience rather than them just having a sports, sports marketing or sports management degree. Um, you can start right now and find an athlete who's going to be at Penn State or Kentucky or somewhere else next year and say, hey, can I help you with your brand? And then when you both go to college, you're now helping a Division One athlete with their brand. They go to the NFL, and now you're helping an NFL player with their brand. 
it's a great way to just get started right now and then saying, hey, I'm, let, me, let me make five TikToks for you a week. You know, it's super, super simple. Just take young people, what you do on social media and now provide it as a service for someone else and you're building up a portfolio for yourself. And it doesn't have to be the football team and it doesn't have to be the basketball team. It could be women's volleyball is huge at Pitt, for instance. Uh, our baseball team here at Point Park is really well known. Another question. Good question. How do you get paid? Me? Yes. So two, two, two fronts. Um, you know, the brands right now, brands pay us to oversee their brand campaigns, their athlete campaigns. Um, you know, we have a, a creative agency. So essentially we get paid, whether it's a billable hour or retainer from a brand. Um, and our athletes that we work with is much more of an investment for us. So we will uh, get their, mar not college athletes. We, college athletes, we serve as more of advisor, but our pro athletes will get anywhere from 15 to 20% of their marketing endorsements that they bring in. So we oversee their marketing contracts. All right, it's, we're just about at 11 o'clock, so we'll be wrapping up. Thanks to everybody for attending. Thanks for the questions.